And without further ado, we're going to go ahead and have Dr. Norris give her talk of screaming for substance use disorder in primary care. Um, I have your introduction, and I wanted to make sure that I read it because this is one of the best bios I've ever <laughs> read. So, Dr. Norris has been medically treating substance use disorder in Maine since 2007 and working with clients who have a substance use disorder since 1989 when she was a psychiatric technician in Washington, D.C. She was certified by the American Board of Osteopathic Family Physicians, the American Board of Addiction Medicine, and the American Board of Obesity Medicine. She has treated patients in rural Maine in the cities of Lewiston and Portland and the towns of Sanford and Kennebunk. And her scope has included inpatient and outpatient detox, obstetrics, neonates, methadone clinics, and intensive outpatient programs. She is the president-elect of the Maine Osteopathic Association married to a fellow DO, has three perfect children and three horrible dogs. So. Hi, everybody. Is this a good distance? We, we had some conversation about should I be doing the handheld Springer thing or should I have a little clippy thing, but anyway. Is this me? Ha, huh, there I am. So I really, obviously my background is as a primary care person, um, my husband is an internist and I like to make mean fun of him because my personal bias is that family medicine is a little better. Um, he was recently saying that we would do the best in a zombie apocalypse, like if we were there for um, The Walking Dead, that we would be cool people to have around, you know, better than the veterinarian who's there. And uh, he said, but, but it, it kind of wouldn't be fun because you would never shut up and like, so where's your functional MRI, internist? And uh, I was like, you know what, I totally would. That's exactly what I would do. So am I doing a, a, a this thing or? Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, look at that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what actually constitutes a screening. And this seems really remedial and duh, but it's actually not. There is actually a rigor. The United States Preventative Services Task Force applies to in order for something to qualify as a screening. And this is especially important in the age of Dr. Google when your patients will come in and they will have a whole lot of opinions about they want to be tested for something. Eventually you will have someone who comes in and says, I would like to be tested for cancer, as though that's a thing. And then they will have a list of tests that they researched of how to test them for particular kinds of cancer. And we really don't have a bottomless pit of health resources and it's also not realistic. As we know, screening can have a cascade of other things. So, so what? What are the three aspects of something being a true screening tool or screening process? One of them is that we screen for things that are common within a population. Colon cancer over age 50, women over 50 for breast cancer, um, developmental disorders in children, that sort of thing. We don't screen for Wegener's granulomatosis because that's not a common, commonly occurring thing. We test for it. If we think we're looking for something in particular, we test for it, but we don't screen for it. Additionally, a screening test must be non-invasive, which is why we don't do screening exploratory labs, right? We, we, it has to be something that you can do relatively easily and in a high volume of people, and it must be shown to change outcomes. It's not useful to test for something that will show you're gonna die next week. And that's why the, the much-touted CA-125 is a, is a ovarian cancer marker, it hasn't been shown to actually change outcomes if you test those things. And that's really important because sometimes, you know, you, you tend to know a lot of tests and a lot of things to look for and diseases to be concerned about, but it's always important to apply this rubric. So in terms of substance use disorder, does it meet that? Eh. Well, there's something called SBIRT. You, have you guys talked about SBIRT? Okay, so it's screening for the common problem of SUD, brief intervention, referral, and treatment. I'm gonna kind of talk over that a little bit because I'm more, I always like people to be thinking about the process rather than regurgitating whatever you know, set of acronyms they were given today and, and just kind of be exploring the problem from a multidisciplinary point of view and really thinking in terms of the community and the resources and kind of what do you do if. So, ah! And then I like to turn off the thing and create a panic among the tech people. Sorry, Bitterford people. So does it meet the metric? Yeah, it's a common problem. 272 people in 2005 and over 370 in 2006. And that's just the people who overdosed. So assuming that that was the mortality rate, that's, it's actually, I think in some areas, surpassed motor vehicle accidents as killers of young people. Um, Non-invasive, well, it, it's, 
any inventory or conversation is only as non-invasive as you get good at making it. If you're invasive in a prying, nasty, emotional way, then it's invasive. If you get comfortable with it, it's non-invasive test. And can it change outcomes? Absolutely. Espert is evidence-based to reduce risky substance use um, behaviors. I, I don't like to use behaviors because it, it sounds like behavior modification and punitive. Hello, Dr. Brandt. Um, but you know, for, for lack of a better, it's it's non-invasive. It's um, it has been shown to change outcomes and secondary outcomes of substance use disorder, i.e., drunk driving, um, secondary health effects, etc. So, how do we screen for it? And it's really a conversation, and it's about when do you screen for it? Who do you who do, who do you think you screen for? I mean. Pretty much anybody, except you do age-appropriate screening, you probably wouldn't be asking the same questions to an 18-year-old college student that you would ask to an 11-year-old. An 11-year-old is a little bit more, do people, do kids in your, high school, in your school use cigarettes? It's that kind of thing. So, so check your vibe. The reason I'm, any question that we ask a patient is only as useful as our ability to get the patient to answer honestly. Does anybody heard the question about substance use disorder or alcohol use or anything like that seem a little judgy? Ever been asked that? And, and we don't even mean to do it, but if you're a healthcare provider, you're essentially in a position of authority, which means that you bring all that baggage with you and there's need for approval and all that other stuff. It is not useful to have a conversation in which people feel pressured to lie to you. So. Do you do any illicit drugs? You know, do you ever drink too much? I would lie. What, what, are some, what are some other ways we've heard the question done badly? Or how much do you eat is my other favorite, and like, because that's not touchy at all. So, so yeah, do you do narcotics illicitly? It, what? What? But I, I've screened for illicit narcotics. I've actually seen that in the literature. Like, first of all, narcotics is a, a legal term. It's not a chemical term. N narcotics is the thing that you are arrested for possession of. It's not, it, it's not like antibiotics. If you, you want to say opioids, say opioids. But if you want to say prescription pills, say that. But narcotics illicitly. Do you drink? Yeah, that's quite a lot. I actually heard somebody say that to a, at, at, at an STI clinic, had asked someone how many partners she had, and the provider actually said, well, that's quite a few. Oh, okay, well, see if I answer your next question. And anything, that we, we know about the CAGE questionnaire, you know, have you ever felt the need to cut down? Have you ever, if you, I mean, most people are savvy enough to realize they're being screened for, you know, risky drinking. There's ways to phrase it that don't make it obvious. You can be a little clever about it. You know, my favorite is how much alcohol do you drink? Because inherent in that is the assumption that, you know, you probably, you know, oh, ev everyone drinks and maybe they drink a lot and that's okay. I just want to know about you. Just like this, you do it in the same tone as what's your favorite ice cream, you know. Because we're not trying to catch people, right? We're trying to start a conversation. We're not, we're not busting people for badness. And this is, I can, except for possibly the, the sexuality stuff, I can think of no other area in primary care that is so laden with morality. We don't have morality around people's sugar control, really. But we have a lot of morality around weight and about, about fat shaming, right? And a lot of morality around substance use disorder. But also, Really be aware of your body language. How much alcohol do you drink? Or, you know, kind of a, have you ever had a blackout? <laughs> you know, it, sometimes people won't answer because they don't want to upset you. Like, they don't care, they're fine with you. But everybody knows, you know, if you're a doctor who's super, super uncomfortable with the question, like, look, doc, clearly you can't handle my answer. I'm just going to do whatever will shut you up and get you to move on. So, so really, these are very important things. You know, number one, address that we need to be screening. But number two, think about how you're going to put it. And the way I would do it is different from the way you would do it, because I talk differently than you do, and, and, and so on and so on. Um, it, it's just like everybody learns their patter. Everybody has their push-play, smoking cessation patter. Everyone has their here's why antibiotics aren't appropriate for your cold patter. And, and just kind of how do you cruise over this without, um, 
You know, it, it, it's like the difference between saying, are you gay, and do you prefer men, women, or both? You know, the, it's, it's how, are you going to be, am I about to label you and assign you to a category, or am I about to just have a conversation about your life? Because if people feel like you're interested in their life, they're more likely to give you information. So, yeah, I've always liked how much alcohol do you drink for the reasons I said. Have you ever been in a routine where you did more than that? That's, that's code for have you ever felt like you needed to cut down. And it also allows for latitude. If I, if I create an open-ended, have, have you ever been in a routine where you're doing more than that? Like, hey, we're just a couple of bros talking about how we drink. And, you know, you ever do more than that? Um, everyone has a glass of wine at dinner. That's the standard, the standard delivery system for everybody's non-existent alcohol problem. Um, sometimes my patients borrow meds from friends or family. Do you ever do that? Um, because sometimes my patients do borrow meds, and, and more of your patients do it than you realize, but if you just put it out there, people can go, you know, well, yeah, sometimes when I get really nerved up, my, my mom will give me one of her Xanax. Um, that's really, really, really common. Or even when my back gets bad, my sister gets a couple of baby perks and she shares them with me. Um, don't, don't call in the Valkyries when they tell you this. Just, then you can say, oh, so, so what do you think about that? Well, I know I shouldn't do that. Okay, but so do you know about how they, you know how about mixing them? Like, we're not trying to, to reform people, we're trying to give them information. If, if they know that certain things aren't safe and they know how they're not safe, they can make a decision. We're trying to do harm reduction. As, as, you know, ideally, everyone would be eating their five a day and drinking lots of water and exercising, but they're not gonna do that either. What we do want is we wanna prevent secondary outcomes. Um, yeah, do you have any concerns around your health, how much you eat, anything you want to change? Sometimes, and I'll, I'll say, you know, I'm full of ideas, but I need to know what's important to you. Well, I have felt kind of out of control with my sugar intake. Okay, so tell me some more about that. Tell me some more about that is probably, it's probably my silver bullet as far as keeping the conversation going. Rather than zoning in and asking, I mean, th this may be the first time this person has ever said out loud, that they're really kind of having a sneaking suspicion that maybe their drinking is getting out of control or that they've never really been able to wean themselves off the oxys that they got two years ago. Or that it doesn't feel big, but it may feel very big to them. And if you laser in and start a cross-examination, just, oh, tell me some more about that. And is it worrying you? The biggest, is it worrying you? And this is a, a good blackout. Is ever, it sound crazy. Have you ever been out, for, out with friends and forgotten part of the evening? Many people don't realize that blackouts aren't kind of what people do. There are a great many, um, especially college age, who really have no idea that blackout isn't a part of everybody's drinking routine. And, you know, to say nothing of the safety issues, and, and people do that with benzodiazepines too. And obviously this, this can get into, you know, non-consensual sexual contact and all this other. So, I'm not saying it can't work to be judgmental and scoldy. I just have never seen it. There may be some unicorn out there who's able to really yell at people and show them a picture of a damaged lung from smoking and show them a mangled car that someone did while they were driving drunk. I have never seen anybody change because they were being picked on. I picked the nun in particular, not because I'm particularly trying to bag on nuns, although we are in a church, which is kind of funny. but. Um, my, my, my uh, business associate, Marty, is writing a play right now uh, called the, Altered, uh, the Elegant Priest and the Altered Boy um, about his, uh, his assault that he experienced as a young man, as an altar server. And um, through very little fault of my own, I'm actually playing the nun who I didn't realize until recently was kind of the bad guy. So I feel like this will be my new, uh, my new spirit animal, if you will. So yeah, people change when they feel that they have the ability to do other. Mammals don't like to change. We only change when there's something really motivating us. We will do the familiar thing rather than the healthy thing. The only way we can implement change in the environment of our office or our, you know, our nursing station or our social work center or, or our recovery center is if people can kind of imagine that they might be able to do differently, that there's some reason. I mean, remember, most substance use disorders are a form of self-medication. So if, if all you've got to offer them is your life will still suck except there won't be drugs to help you deal with it, that's not a very compelling, you know, motivator. I wouldn't do it. So know what's around. 
most people know where to send somebody if they have a cancer problem, and they probably know if someone's having a heart attack. I have had a distressing amount of otherwise really intelligent people try to send patients to things that don't exist. Go to the hospital and check yourself in for detox. Well, not all hospitals do detox. Detox isn't appropriate for everybody. You don't really need to detox people for, for opioids. You, you get them into treatment for other reasons. Um, you know, is there a program for the uninsured? If somebody is indigent or uninsured or self-pay or self-employed, be aware before you send them to do this really terrifying thing like try to get sober, what's gonna be available to them? That, remember, in order for them to present, they have to find the place. They have to say, hey, do you know where I can go for? They have to tell their loved one that they're gonna be out for work. They have to do all this, and then they can get there having done all these painful disclosures, and they actually don't do the thing that the patient thinks they do, or it's not what they need. It's never a bad idea to call ahead. Hey, I have a person here who, or you can call. Do you know where and when? Do people know what where and when is? It, you, you probably can Google it. it ba back when I started doing this, it was like on, on printed things, it folded, but um, the where and when is the list of 12-step uh, meetings in the area. Um, there's usually a where and when for NA, AA, and it'll have along the, um, each meeting where it is, what time it is, whether it's open, whether it's women only. Open means can, um, can people who are not in recovery go, like a supportive family member. At least have some idea. If I just realized that I had a life-threatening condition like heart disease, and my doctor said, look, I'm really concerned about your heart. I'm afraid you're gonna have a heart attack. I think you should probably call a cardiologist someday, and you probably want to go around and see if there's any support groups for people with heart disease. I don't know where any are myself, but I bet you could look it up. How would that go? No, not at all. And, and people with heart disease aren't ashamed of having heart disease. It's, it's not gonna be a horrible thing to tell their mom that they have heart disease or their boss that they need to take a week off for their, pe people, people bring you baked goods when you have heart disease. However, I have a patient who was sent, who I think found his way to me, took him two years, he got up the courage to tell his doctor that he had developed a problem with drugs. What's a little funny about this is that the doctor was actually prescribing controlled substances, so I'm not sure how it escaped the guy's notice for two years, if, unless he was never drug testing, but finally got up his nerve to, for two, to, to say, look, I have this problem. The doctor responded by cutting him off from his meds, basically firing him, saying, you're gonna need to find some help. Gave him the number to Mercy Recovery, which most of you know has been closed, for a while now. It had been closed for six months at the time this guy gave him the number. And I will see you in six months, but you need to be ready to put the work in. Now, how, remember how many people died of overdose in Maine? I, yeah. So, ironically, this guy also was a colon cancer survivor. And I said, so, when you had your colon cancer, did he give you the phone number? And I'm not trying to trashed the doctor, but I was pretty pissed off, and I wanted the patient to realize that this was kind of a failure of a system and not that he just sucked. When you had colon cancer, did he give you the phone number to an oncology center that no longer existed and say he'd see you in six months? Good luck with that colon cancer. No, no, he did not. That's not what happened. Um, and is the person interested in changing? And does the person really have an out-of-control problem or do they need just to have more of a conversation? Like, not everyone who's drinking a lot during a divorce or who is maybe started relying on grandma Xanax a little excessively. They don't all need to go to quote, you know, detox. Some of them just need to go set some different goals. Maybe we're looking at an unaddressed depression problem. Probably we're looking at an undepressed depression problem or whatever. Or we have pseudo addiction because we have chronic pain and it just suddenly became illegal to treat it, right? So is the person interested in changing? Remember the nun. If I harangue you, you're not gonna change. If I scold you, you're not gonna change. I can move heaven and earth to get you better but, and, and I have a social worker who works in my office who is classic for, she'll spend four hours on the phone trying to find resources for somebody who was never that interested in getting help anyway, but she's so pushy they didn't know how to shut her up, so they just said, sure, find me a therapist. Yes, the reason I say this, rehab is not a thing. 
Rehab is a thing to a certain extent if you have an infinite level of resources and you live in Southern California or you're getting flown to Florida. In Maine, I don't, there are intensive outpatient programs which are evidence-based and show l good long-term, you go there three hours a day for six weeks and then you go to kind of step down and so forth and there's usually medications involved. There are sober houses, there are detox, which is really more appropriate for alcohol or benzodiazepines and, and I don't want to get into the weeds about why but I'm certainly happy to answer questions. But rehab is not a thing. You can't send people to it, at least not in Maine you can't. Overwhelmingly, many people have tried to solve the opioid problem in Maine by saying we need to send people to rehab. I have bat cleanup for many of those rehab alumni who came back and, as the evidence would suggest, relapsed because not only is rehab resource intensive, but it is ineffective and is certainly put, it increases people's risk for, for fatal overdose afterwards. So if you get nothing else out of this, don't find out that when you uncover someone having a disorder that you try to send them to rehab or worse yet, tell their family to find them a rehab to go to. It's, it's not a thing and it's not, in no other condition would you just allow someone's opinion about what they thought might work to guide your, your treatment. Use evidence-based referral. So check your toolkit. So do I have the first idea what to do? Before you start screening for things, at least have an idea of what you're gonna do if you get a yes answer. It's kind of like, has anybody ever tried to learn a foreign language and you learned how to ask where's the bathroom, but then you didn't learn how to understand the answer to the question, so it's not actually that useful? Um, yeah, and you have a list of resources. The where and when is great. If you were screening for hyperglycemia, you know dietitians, endocrinologists, a nurse educator. Do I have the bandwidth right now? If it's a really busy day and you've got people double booked or you're a health, you know, you're a, a, um, like a healthcare nurse, a nurse educator, and you've got a bunch of things to do and it's pandemonium, this may not be the day to open this particular can of worms. If someone is acutely in crisis, that's a whole other thing. That's not screening anymore. That's diagnosis and treatment, right? But for screening, don't go, you know, j just like you don't go down the have you ever experienced sexual abuse conversation if you don't have a pretty robust idea of what you're going to do with a yes answer because otherwise you're just traumatizing people and they've just told you their darkest secret about their drinking problem and you kind of went, oh, well, you know what, and someday we'll talk about this, but not today because that also says it's not important, which it is, it's very important. And yeah, no counselors who are good. You, does anyone know what a 12-step run is? Okay. There's a lot of really great, strangely, I know a lot of really great detective novels that have people in recovery, so I was really pleased to discover that that's out there. Stephen King also writes about 12-step runs in um, the second Shining book, uh, Dr. Sleep. So what it is is, say I'm in long-term recovery, and someone comes to me and says, can you talk to my sister who's got a bad drinking problem? I don't know what to say. I don't know, you know, everything sucks. This is way out of my league. I, I don't know how to talk about this. So then I go and I get my other friend who's in long-term recovery and we literally go over and talk to the person. I, I used to know people when I lived in another community who would go to hospitals and do this. Like in our little, you know, podunk memorial where I was, um, I actually had people who would come, say someone came in for pneumonia and they happened to go into alcohol detox while they were there. Um, while they were in the hospital, these people in the recovery community would come in. If someone identifies to you that they're in long-term recovery, first of all, the only thing that should be coming out of your mouth is, good for you, how's your recovery going? You're not supposed to get all weird if they say they're on methadone. You don't flinch when they say, oh, well, good for you. Like, they didn't just tell you that they're a sex offender. They told you that they're in long-term recovery. Treat it that way. But they can be a really valuable resource. I have a great many people who I see for other things, but they're in recovery, who they, then they always go in twos because it's dangerous to go just one. And they will sit down and they will, they will talk to the person. They will say, I know you're scared. Why don't you come to a meeting with us? Why don't you, you know, come talk to this counselor I know? It's a really good resource, it's free, and in general, it's part of their recovery, so they see it as, as an important part of their, they, they always say you don't do one-sided recovery, you don't, you're not stingy with your recovery. That's a really good resource, and they like it, and they have more bandwidth than you do. If they're doing 12-step runs, they have more bandwidth than you do. Um, and have someone you can run things by. I, name me know Patrice Lockhart, she's the eating disorder lady at, at Mercy. 
I talk to her maybe once every two years when I run into some weirdo eating disorder thing. And I don't bother her too much, but I, I, I don't know anything where near where she was. So I go, hey, Patrice, oh, hi. And then I just say, I have this person who, and then she'll say, oh, well, what you want to do is blah. And I go, thank you. And sometimes she'll say they probably should come in, and sometimes she'll say get the go to this therapist. But just just have you know have your have your um, your list of experts, have your uh, emergency, you know your emergency people. But you can start the process. Remember, this problem was going on before you showed up, and you don't need to be the superhero who's going to fix it. But you can make suggestions. I have a suggestion: go to two drinks a day instead of three. That actually has been shown to work. If you literally give people an assignment that, not when you're like a full on have an active alcohol use disorder, but when you're a risky drinker, when you're at risk, try going to two, see how it feels. You're not judgy, they, you're not doing the experience of they said they had a problem and you threw a bag over their head and dragged them off to rehab, but you just said, hey, what about this? I had a lady um, actually earlier today who wasn't sure that she wanted to stop drinking. She knew she wanted to cut down. She wasn't really sure what her relationship was. And I told her, do what, do what women did in the 1950s, wait till after five, have a five o'clock rule. Because she's found that she really is out of control when she drink, starts drinking at three. Okay, wait, this helps with smoking, right? It's been shown to reduce smoking. If you make a room where it's illegal to smoke, if you can only smoke outside, if you can't smoke in your car, this actually does reduce smoking volume. Same thing with substances. If someone fails to study for their drug test, meaning they have a non-adherent test, we don't say a dirty urine because this is not a morality play, this is a biological monitoring of a problem. They have a non-adherent drug test. Most of you haven't probably worked in a lot of, the norm, and any, any physicians in here can, can validate this, the norm is you uncover that someone is using illicit narcotics and you cut them off and punt them out. They're, they're cast out of the, uh, the Emerald City. That's not appropriate. You have to refer them for some kind of help. You don't have to make them go, but you offer them. My dear patient, you're fired letter specifically says, if you feel like you have a drug problem and that's why there's cocaine in your urine when there was just supposed to be Vicodin, come on in and let's talk about it. Not, I hereby pronounce you evil, see you in hell. That's not, that's not therapeutic, that's not what we do. Um, if they show up to your office under the influence or they have more than one DUI, they have a problem. We're not screening them. I always tell people there's two places that you should never show up impaired, your probation officer and your addiction doctor. If you're showing up to my office at 10 o'clock in the morning and you're high, which was two people yesterday, um, the horse is out of the barn. Now we need to offer them treatment. They'll lie. They'll say, I'm just tired, you know, because I wouldn't know the difference between tired Right, but, but that's what they'll say, but, but you can at least offer it. The positive predictive value of one DUI is not very strong. The positive predictive value of two DUIs, meaning that you have a problem, is extremely robust. It's about, it's, it's over 94% positive predictive value. If you've been, had more than one DUI, and that's a great way of screening. So, you ever been pulled over DUI? And again, use the same tone of voice, have you ever, you ever gone bowling? Um, they have a problem. No, the police aren't after them. No, they don't have a grudge against them. No, I was just tired. If you have been pulled over and, and charged with DUI twice, you have a drug, you have a drug or alcohol problem. Um, because that also implies, think of all the times you were probably driving impaired when the police didn't notice. So this is my cousin who is an internist. We are the, we are the doctors Norris and um, looking very professional. Any questions right now? Thoughts, ruminations, musing. When's the play? <laughs> When's the play? That, that's funny because um, Marty is Marty, and periodically, it was supposed to be November, and then he read a Yeats poem, The Stolen Child, and that made him revamp his entire thing. And so we were saying May, but I'm a little concerned because I haven't seen a script yet. So someday, someday I will be an evil nun. Yes? Do you find many on your face that it takes repeated efforts to, uh, you know, to offer those options that are asked questions that you have that don't reveal the first time? 
Um, I have never had, I mean, except for people who are specifically seeing me because they, have, they want treatment for a problem, I have never had somebody say, you know what, you're right. I, I have a problem and I want to get help for it. Like that, that I, but I have had many people who, when I bring it up again, are maybe, like they've gone from pre-contemplative to contemplative. Uh, I've also had people who um, said no, there was no problem, but they came back and maybe they, I was in a group, they saw a bunch of people, they came back to me because I was nice to them. But that was the thing, is what you're really doing is leaving the door open. You're saying, I'm not going to be mean to you if you tell me this because I won't think I, you're a terrible person. What else? Yes. With your patients who have had more than one DUI, what's your response to that? Um, you mean like, how do I say it? I say, well, in general, that, that pretty much means you have a problem. Um, what should, then I explore, well, what are they doing now? You know, are they still drinking? Are they concerned about that? Um, are there any restrictions on their life? You know, just, just sort of, well, so tell me some more. Like, so what was going on? You know, you, it, it just, it becomes an opportunity. Um, I have the advantage in that I have enough people I know in recovery, I know where the meetings are and all that, that I can sort of offer things and say, you know, I hear this meeting's really good, I'm, there's someone who would happen, and, and, and 12-step isn't the end-all be-all, but it's certainly a good idea to at least say, you know what, would it be okay if I gave you, you know, why don't we set you up and just talk to this person? Um, what I never do is start telling them about the dangers of fatty liver disease, which that literally is, I mean, you, you, people, the no, 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 no. Um, so so what, where are you with it? Are you worried about it right now? What do you think would happen, you know? Have you ever, have you ever thought about cutting down differently? Um, and then how they answer the question kind of leads how the rest of the questions are gonna go. If they get defensive and angry, it's, dude, dude, I just want you to be okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to pick on you. Everyone's contributed their misery in some way. I just want you to be okay. But, but that's kind of how, does that make sense? What? Is someone else get, okay, yeah. <laughs> Mike on the move. Um, in terms of finding local resources, so I'm starting third year rotations in Lewiston at CMMC next year and we have, we're gonna, I will be doing this expert training, which is a little terrifying. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come closer because I don't hear very well. Okay. I used to drive a Jeep. When, you're f <laughs> when, when looking for resources, other than kno knowing um, where the local 12-step things mm -hmm. are, do you just Google and then hope people are good? Um, like, how do you find Well, I mean, resources? remember, the first time you show up in a community, you're not supposed to, but you probably know someone who knows someone. Um, I would put in a plug for Grace Street Services at, uh, in Lewiston. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you, you kind of network, but that's, that's also what you do for who's a good surgeon. Like when I relocated from Blue Hill to Kennebunk, I suddenly didn't know who any of the people were. And so I had to ask people like, hey, is, and, and then you sort of know like which orthopedist is kind of a jerk and, um, you know, who's really good with, you know, I have one orthopedist guy that's really good with my kind of squirrely, anxious people. He's really good at calming them down. Like, you sort of just build a repertoire. Uh, I, I like to call people up if I'm new to the area and just sort of say, hi, my name is, I understand in the phone book that you do blah. Can you tell me a little bit about, so, okay, so if I have a person who blah, what would that, and do you take this insurance? And, when you're newer to an area, you have a little more time to do that, and it's good to sort of build a, build, build a, um, a roster, if you will. But that's what I would do. Yeah, and you, you can just Google. Um, I would make the call before the patient does, because if they turn out to be nutty, you don't, the, the patient's gonna say, see, I, that, I tried to go to therapy and that didn't work. Um, yeah, uh, there, well, depending on what you're doing, the, the Portland, Re uh, Portland Recovery Community Center on Forest Ave um, is a great collection of resources. Um, Shelby Briggs is just awesome. Um, 
if, for any of you who were at my, my addiction talk in the fall, she was the speaker there. She is the coordinator with the Westbrook Police Department, but she's a recovery advocate. Um, we have a Gray Street in Portland. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would start with like the, the PRCC, the Portland Recovery Community Center, only because they know where all this stuff is. Uh, Westbrook Police Department, believe it or not, is really, really on their game as far as they have like a whole list of here's all the people around who do recovery stuff. Um, and there's a network of young people in recovery. They're fa it's a national network, but there's a Portland chapter. Uh, Southern, what is it? Southern Maine University, the, over there in Portland. Um, they have, I'm sorry? Yeah, USM, that's right, thank you. I was, I was morphing it with SMCC and creating a, a new. Uh, so yeah, th they actually have a very active recovery campus, uh, USM does. Thank you. What else? I had a question for you about online hi. resources for your mm -hmm. patients. I'm a physician at uh, Family Doc. And, hi. Um, hi. And I just wonder um, whether you use Reddit or refer people to any of those communities online and whether there's any evidence they're effective. Uh, there are communities online that, and, and again, my not doing it doesn't imply that others aren't good. It's just that I don't know them as well. Uh, and also, my patients tell me when they've had a good experience. The, the Facebook groups, there's a lot of recovery Facebook groups. Uh, that's also good for people who are uncomfortable. I mean, it is a big leap to be like, I'm gonna go into a room full of strangers and say something that has been bringing me a lot of shame. Um, SoberRecovery.com um, is a network that people like. Um, yeah, the YPR, Young People in Recovery. There, there's also uh, AA.com, like there, you, there's, uh, there's a lot of live chat meetings. You can just get on at any time of day or night and someone's on, which is a very comfortable media. It, it would be weird to me, but it's very comfortable for a lot of people. That's exactly why I asked you. There's some people who just say, I'm not a group person, never have been, can't do yeah. social anxiety. Uh, uh, although I, I will say, and one of my med students was, was laughing, because I, I would say, I feel like I should give a toaster to someone because they're the 537th person to say they're not one to talk in front of people and they're really uncomfortable with groups because that's pretty much everybody who ever went to a meeting in the first time. And, um, and yeah, you get, you get old timers and go, yeah, I, I, was, I was terrified and I just sat there looking mad at everybody. So, so there, there is a lot to be said for building an area, like a, a recovery community in your area simply because you don't necessarily want to tell your mom that you're thinking about using, but you might want to tell your fellow recovery soldier. So, but yeah, the on, on, and, and it's also a great way to get comfortable with the lingo and with kind of the, the concept. What else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Norris. <laughs> Yes, all the things. Yeah, thank you so much for coming down, taking time away from your three perfect children and your three horrible dogs. Thank you. Oh. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and move on, and we will hear from a fellow student, Alma, who is a UNE social work student, and she's going to talk about her involvement with persons with substance abuse issues. So. Welcome, Alma, to the stage. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I am Alma. I'm a first year student, uh, social work student here at UNE. Uh, I've been a member of Primary Care Progress for the past year. Um, I've joined Primary Care pretty much um, on my first day um, interning with Julie Shermer. Uh, what got me into Primary Care Progress is that it's a multidisciplinary team and a student-driven team. Uh, organization. 
so that's what made me actually join Primary Care of Progress to see students come together about important issues. Um, so tonight I would like to share my experience in working with patients affected by substance use. Um, as I can understand, most of you, you here tonight may feel, I am also, um, I have a family who was impacted by substance use abuse. Um, I know it's very difficult to speak about it. However, in order for us to make change, we must openly talk about this issue. For the next few minutes, I'll be using first person, but I'll be speaking in my uncle voice. It was early fall 2001 when my family and I landed at Portland International Jet Port. We came all the way from refugee camp in Uganda. I remember stepping off the plane. I felt a breeze of golden sunshine radiate across my face. As I looked into a distance, I saw trees, square houses, I wonder who occupied these homes and whether they will be my neighbors. I knew at that moment, this is my final destination. I knew this was my home, a safe haven for my family. Despite feeling the essence, bondage, and safety, my heart kept pounding because it had been 20 hours since I had my last drink. I started drinking at age 15. From that day on, alcohol became a part of my life. It was a quick solution to my problem. And for years, I've attempted to stop drinking. However, each time became the next. And each day became an emotional and physical struggle that was only made better by alcohol. Some days I started my day with drinking and ended it with drinking. Other days, I battled withdrawal symptoms. I would lay in bed all day, nauseous and shaking. Once a neighbor found me and called an ambulance. In 2006, I was diagnosed with liver cirrhosis. I was devastated knowing the poor prognosis of this disease. Consumed by this fire, I decided to take my own life by jumping off the fourth floor building, apartment of my building. I was stuck between my desire to stop drinking and my desire to be healthy. Fortunately, I was rushed to a hospital where I recovered and moved on to a rehab center. Months later, my demon returned to hunt me once again. This time, I lost everything. My home and the trust of my family and friends. Today, I'm physically disabled from addiction to alcohol. I limp all day in Congress Street roaming for a place to rest before I head back to Preble Street for the night, I asked myself, how did I get here? I am homeless once again in search of safety. I am afraid of my own self-destruction. I will never forget that day when I landed in the United States with the sun radiating across my face. Not only was I fighting to transition into a new culture, I was fighting my lifelong demon, alcohol. I kept promising myself that I will stop. It is 16 years later, and each time I drink, I make the same promise. As a South Sudanese native, I can understand, and being in social work field, um, and also working 
with clients who've been affected or suffering from this disease. I can understand that my own culture has great influence on people to seek help. Thank you so much for listening to me tonight. This event has given each one of us a chance to connect through a very important issue in primary care progress. And tonight, my hope is that we'll better understand this disease, not only through believing in change, but through making change. Thank you. Thanks, Alma. So as Alma alluded to, um, Alma and I are part of Primary Care Progress as are a couple of other students here are scattered around the tables. Um, and our mission is to improve primary care in Maine with a focus on leadership and development, interprofessional co collaboration, patient care, and community outreach to high-risk, underserved populations. And we're a collection of interprofessional students from Tufts School of Medicine, Unicom, Dental Medicine, Pharmacy, and the various uh, students at the Westbrook College of Health Professions, and hopefully soon we'll have University of Southern Maine School of Nursing join us as part of our organization. And we have a, a core leadership team interspersed with uh, different health professional students from different years so that every year we can get uh, sort of a, a fresh idea from an upcoming first or second year students and we have the leadership from the third or fourth year students or however long their programs happen to last. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand the microphone off and each of them could tell you a little bit about why they joined Primary Care Progress. So first, Anthony. Hey everybody, um, my name's Anthony. I'm a third year medical student at uh, Unicom. And really it was three things that came together why I personally joined Primary Care Progress. Um, there's no denying the infectious energy of Julie Sharmer when she talks about something, you just really get excited about it too. And um, she had me sold probably from the first town hall that we had. Uh, the second was just Portland in general, growing up in greater Portland. Um, just love the area, the people, everything about it, and hoping that something good happens to it. And the third was wanting to do primary care and wanting to learn more about it um, take more of an interprofessional team approach and just seeing what other fields had in the terms of a viewpoint towards um, patient presentations. So all three things really got me hooked and I'm very glad I joined. Hi. Um, so I am a first year social work student. I've joined Primary Care Progress because, um, first off, being a social worker, um, as you all know from my speech, I'm not, I'm American by citizenship, <laughs> but um, I was born in Africa. So in my culture, actually, there's nothing such as mental health. So to actually bring that into primary care progress and learn from my um, team leadership, um, medical student, pharmacy student, and just get to share each other profession and learn from each other to provide that passionate care is what actually got me into this, um, to join primary care progress. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alexandra. I'm a second year dental student. Um, when I think of healthcare, I think of teamwork. And it's so easy for us to get just totally wrapped up in our own profession. Being a part of the different IPEC events and main primary care progress has really helped me to break out of my dental shell. And I really believe that gaining these opportunities and these skills and teamwork is what is going to allow me to give my patients the best care that I possibly can. And that's the most important thing to me. So that's, that's why I've joined. Uh, 
Good evening, everybody. I'm going to come a little more in the middle. I couldn't tell if everyone could see you guys. Um, so I'm a fourth year medical student at Tufts. Um, in my interest in primary care, I'm uh, going into internal medicine. I start in July. Um, and I have interests uh, you know, in geriatrics and palliative care. Um, and then, you know, of course, primary care itself, very um, passionate about preventative medicine. And uh, you know, I think these interests really evolved over the past two years in my clinical training. Um, what really struck me being in the hospital, being outpatient in all different settings, um, were just the, the barriers that patients face when accessing care and then also when trying to maintain you know, a relationship with a primary care physician. Um, and then as well as how you know, really collaboration interprofessionally can make a huge impact um, on patients directly. Uh, so kind of just doing a flashback to last year, uh, we had our first uh, you know, annual town hall event about a year ago. Andrew Singer came and spoke, who is the president of National Primary Care Progress. And so he you know, shared with us this national movement. You know, there's about 50 different chapters across the country. And at that time, we all had a debrief, UNE, Tufts, Main Med, students, faculty, discussing you know, what would this look like here? Could we actually form a chapter? Um, different schools, you know, different professions, and I am very proud to say that a year later, not only have we actually established uh, a chapter, we are nationally recognized. Uh, a few of us attended the summit last August in Cambridge. Um, we have about 25 chapter members, um, and it is in professional. We have social work, dental, pharmacy, medical students, um, and a strong leadership team. So I am just, I can't tell you enough how proud I am to be graduating and been, have been part of a, uh, a mission that is just so meaningful. So thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> all right, so the next part of the evening, you all notice that you're seated at these circular tables for a purpose. Um, on your table, there are different cases that we would like you to go ahead and read through together and then talk about the case as an interprofessional team, and there's also discussion questions. And you'll notice that there are four cases, but we'd like each of the tables to do a specific case. So if you're at tables one and two, please go ahead and read over case one and discuss it. If you're at tables three and four, please do case two. If you're at tables five and six, case three. And if you're at tables seven and eight, please do case four. And we'll have some time for you all to discuss, and we'll get back together in about 15, 20 minutes. Tables uh, one and two had case number one. And if you guys want to just glance over this, but you also have a copy at your table. Um, we'll go ahead and go around. Where tables one and two are where? OK, thanks for the points. That helps. So hopefully you've all elected an individual to speak out with your case. Yeah, and if you wouldn't mind just sort of giving the highlights and your impressions of what you would do as a team. So we've all had different cases, yes? Yes, so you guys are case one. Our case was a, um, a team um, in a rural community where the um, physician and obstetrician um, was increasing, and well-loved obstetrician was increasingly um, coming in under the influence and a patient's family member raised this to the team. So the, uh, um, we had a great discussion about from different um, perspectives in terms of uh, different professional perspectives how we felt about this. And we talked about, you know, there's, there's pretty straightforward things in place for um, this to go to the board of nurse, uh, board of medicine, sorry, um, and um, and uh, starting that process, and we had a lot of conversation about the conversation about this and how we'd start the conversation, listen to what the concern was, listen and listen and listen, and then get our um, pr the process in place, which we ethically have to do um, to get that physician um, taken care of, and that Maine has a very good process for this. And then we talked about the need for debriefing the team. And we talked a lot throughout about the fact that we learn a lot in our professional education about teams. 
but we really never actually create teams in our workplaces. We never actually have a team. We all know how to be on a team, and we all know what our role is on a team, but I don't think we ever actually do conversation about team building with the people that we're working with. So we talked about the debriefing as a team, and, and we had some good conversation about the fact that oftentimes this comes up as a result of something bad happening. So when there's an event, when there's a sentinel event or, or something really bad happens, then we debrief as a team, um, but we could be doing that in advance of this. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, pass it to the next table. Have you guys had any anything to add about this case? Um, we talked about a lot of the same things about the first week. We had the same case. Um, I don't know if we added, or we talked about both of the students. We talked about reacting as a student versus one student, which are much in a um, professional level on how we would react differently. Um, there's just different channels to go through at this point in our learning. Um, and also that the actual interaction like, took a position. We, most of us would want another position to talk to us versus having it come like trickle down from the authority. Um, even if you are reporting, just having a face to face face and being like, I, I'm, this is what I'm seeing. Um, if this was me, I would want to be told by um, a peer rather than somebody higher up. So just that discussion. Great. I'm Christina, third year medical student at Tufts. Thanks. All right. In our next case, I'll switch the, the PowerPoint, um, but was case two, team three here. You're the spokesperson? Okay. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind just describing the case and your impressions before you get into the, the meat of it. So I'm Katie, I'm a, well, technically third year nursing student, but first year on this campus. Uh, our patient's SJ, 33 year old male. manager he hasn't talked to them in three months uh, no strong ties to family has used a counselor but has no progress with them so he doesn't really go to them as much um, what we found with this case was the barriers to overcome he has a language barrier so we would definitely need an interpreter um, other barriers that we found were um, the stereotype of addiction and just how people kind of see addiction just as a problem and not as a disease or an illness. Uh, his family and culture, like is drinking normal in his family and culture, is uh, does his family drink or anything like that? Uh, but we may not know that because he has no strong, to, no strong ties to his family. Mental health due to the depression and PTSD. Um, he says he wants to change, but you know, people say they want to change. It's kind of like New Year's resolutions doesn't mean you're going to do it. Um, so that's a big issue that we found. Financial issues and so like if, does he have insurance? Is there any way we can find a way to make the commit commitment work to getting sober and recovery? And what's his daily lifestyle like? Does he have transportation? Um, does he have contact phone friends? And uh, especially like what's his uh, nutrition like? Um, Another big discovery we found was the need for more info. We always want to know why. Like, you know, why is he drinking? Why does he want to change? Why isn't he met with, you know, support groups? Or what has he done before to try to quit drinking? And um, another big one was patient education. Thank you. All right, let's the next spokesperson. So we have the same case, and I think the biggest surprise Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Lindsay. I'm a second year dental student here at um, UNE. And our big surprise for this was that this is actually Alma's uncle that Julie told us. Um, Julie revealed that to us. Um, so we, as a table with our different backgrounds, talked about um, 
you know, we're able to treat this as medical providers, we're able to treat the symptoms and get him back to health, but what happens after? What does that look like for him? You know, that's where it's really out of our control in a lot of ways, but um, we can set him up for success. And how do we do that as providers? How do we connect him with the right resources? How do we ensure that he's not just not just putting out the fire every single time? And um, so uh, collectively, we talked about just connecting him with resources. Um, there's something, a dual diagnosis program, where they treat the mental, um, the mental component, the depression and the substance abuse together. Can he get plugged into that? You know, making sure to connect him with the counselor, social worker. Um, some of the things we talked about tonight, like the 12-step run, is that a, a, a um, an option? And then making sure that he ha has someone in within his cultural background to be able to connect with as well. Um, yeah, I think that's a good summary of it. Thank you. All right, so on to case three, which, yeah, table five here. Um, hi, I'm Chelsea. I'm in the Accelerated Nursing Program my first semester here at UNE. Um, so ours was case three, which dealt with a 25-year-old male who has substance abuse problems, who's been in and out uh, the hospital. He currently lives with his mom to pay off his debt from um, his hospital bills. He refuses um, any AA or substance abuse meetings. Um, however, he's in the office um, probably due to not having a PCP, but he still came in. So what we've kind of focused on for our case study was how to approach the situation with his refusal to not go to any other meetings um, about his problems. And we talked a lot um, as two nursing students at dental and four attendings here at the table, we talked a lot about non-judgmental, open-ended questions and a key role in building a relationship with um, him, showing support and confidentiality and showing that it's okay and that things will get better and just being there and not making it seem like he's a terrible person. Um, some of his barriers that he would have would be he's uninsured, he doesn't have a PCP, so we would be there to kind of help him through that process and kind of um, aid him in finding one. And the ability of resources, technically, I guess, is this was supposed to be in Northern Maine or something. So he might have a lack of resources and support systems where he is. Um, and so overall, we would just kind of do the whole creating a relationship, like I said, and go from there and treat the patient um, as a person who um, outside of his substance abuse, what else does he do? What is he, um, what is he good at in life? You know, what are his hobbies? Kind of treating him more as a uh, person not with a problem, so. Hmm? Not by his addiction. Yeah, not by his addiction, just by. Okay, so that's what we had, basically. Thank you. <laughs> right, next table. I'm Courtney, and I'm a um, senior in the Accelerated Nursing Program. Um, so we had a lot of the same points. Um, we just we focused on what the system did well was having life-saving measures and doing those referrals and follow-up. Um, and then for interviewing, we said doing a mo motivational type interview, um, asking open questions, open-ended questions, um, and kind of making it more social and just letting him know that he's not gonna be punished for what he shares because I think a lot of people don't wanna talk about substance use issues because um, they're scared of you know, being punished um, and letting him know that we're there to help. Um, our main barriers were finances and the fact that he's uninsured. Um, so having financial counseling would be a good thing too and teaching him to kind of save his money and put some towards um, his health expenses. Um, and then one of our kind of surprises for our group was Alma brought up um, the Behavioral Home Health Organization, which um, is a support system that can kind of come to your home and it has doctors and nurses and um, a peer who has previously experienced the same kind of um, issue as he did. So we thought that would be a really good thing for him to have a support system that um, he doesn't really have to go outside of his home for because it doesn't seem like he's really willing to do that or at that point. Um, 
And then we also talked a little bit about Narcan kits um, and possibly um, kind of showing his mom how to use it maybe or someone who's around him in case an overdose occurs again. So. Cool. That's a cool idea. Thank you. All right. And then last but not least, case four. Who's your spokesperson? Okay. Hi, my name is Rebecca, and I'm a second year dental student, and our case is a little lengthy, so bear with me. Um, basically, what we were given was a 34-year-old female, and she came in, um, she has, she's kind of hurting right now. She has hypertension, um, obesity, um, anxiety, COPD, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, she's a smoker, and she's been coming in to her Medicaid office um, to just try to get some help. She does have, she's, her main concerns are trying to cut down on smoking and she does present with a fever, um, a slight cough, and has had symptoms of um, COPD symptoms and ammonia. And then through all of this, she also has been unable to afford many of her medications and then she actually just opened up about some domestic violence from her spouse and um, a little bit of a backstory of her daughter and son um, just they're in their teens and they're coming out of high school and they're also having some issues as well so i'll pass off the mic hi i'm sarah i'm in the accelerated nursing program um, so our biggest goal was to talk about how as a collaborative group we would, you know, work on all her problems together, whether it's through medicine, pharmacy, social work. Um, her first goal is safety. Um, it sounds like she's not safe at home. So Portland has a lot of great resources for domestic violence, um, ones that don't involve um, financial obligations on her part. So that's something she really struggles with. Um, just working together to bring down, you know, with pharmacy, the cost of medications, um, planning her medications, working with medicine to help her develop a plan that she can tackle all these difficult health problems she has. Um, just sounds like she needs support in all areas from a wide collaborative team. Um, she really needs help from everyone in her practice. and. It's all has to be based on low income and services that can still be provided with that. So we found a lot of ways that we could all help her. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I think one of the themes that was present in what everyone um, brought today to our discussion was just to listen and just be present for her because there's so many um, you know, issues that are being brought up dur the, during the visit and really just identify what her main concern is and, um, and just be there and to listen. You can pass it on to the next table. Yeah. Hi there, so my name is Paul. I'm a second year dental student here at UNE. Um, we had the same case. Um, so some of the things that we wanted to share with everyone is, uh, so obviously this patient has a lot going on um, so we thought it'd be very important to kind of take a step back and talk to the patient about what their main concern is. So what is the patient's chief complaint or chief concern? Um, a lot of this stuff is chronic, so it might not, even though it sounds um, like a lot and it's a lot to handle right now and we might just be learning about it a lot for the first time, um, it's important to keep the patient in mind. So what are their goals moving forward? The next thing we wanted to focus on was what kind of support system this patient might have. Um, she's got two kids. Um, she's in a relationship that um, sounds unhealthy. So what kind of support system might this patient need, but also what support system might this patient have? Um, one of her daughters is 18. She's studying to be a CNA and she wants to go to nursing school. So maybe that's something we can focus on as a positive with this patient as kind of a, kind of a rock to kind of move forward with treatment on. Um, the other thing is, uh, even though the patient is a heavy smoker, she's actually done pretty well in kind of trying to stop and going through cessation protocols. So um, the patient is motivated. Um, she just needs the right resources, so getting to that. 
And the last thing that my group wanted me to tell you about um, was the role that maybe a dentist could play. I think it might have caught some people at the table off guard. Um, so uh, for us, when we see a new patient or a patient at all, we go through a complete medical history. So we would see all of these things showing up on a medical history. Um, what's different is we're, you know, we're, we're not the free clinic, we're not her PCP that she regularly sees. She might not be as on guard or kind of apprehensive with us. And so we might be able to open up avenues of a discussion that she might not have had before. And it's a different setting and it's a different individual. So just being able to have that conversation. Um, we have um, pretty good training on like getting these red flags, like seeing them and being able to recognize them. And then um, we also talked about how maybe we don't have that much training on being experts at dealing with this, but finding the right people in a healthcare community to kind of get the ball rolling and making sure that the team can move forward with this patient to benefit them, so. Well, thanks, Paul. All right, well, thank you all for contributing to that discussion. Um, I hope you all found value in talking to other health professions, because I know I certainly enjoy listening and discussing these cases with you guys, so. We're gonna go ahead and move on and um, Oh, actually, Chris Hall would like to say a few things because a lot of the expert leaders here are in the room tonight. So here you go, Chris. <laughs> I'm so subtle when I stand up. <laughs> oh, yeah, Chris Hall. So I'm so happy to see you all here today. Um, I'm the uh, program manager for the Interprofessional Education Collaborative, and it just warms all the parts of my heart to <laughs> have you talking to each other and learning about from and with each other and having it be a student-led organization. It uh, gives, us, gives us hope for the future. Um, I'm also uh, managing the uh, ESPERT grant, a three-year federal grant about screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, as you well know at this point. Um, and we do have some ESPERT student leaders in the room, and uh, I want to convey to them thank you for stepping up and being a leader. And in the back corner, we have Brianna Nally waving at you as ESPERT student leaders, um, and she would love for you to complete some paperwork before you go home over in the corner there. If you're interested in expert student leadership, we will have a cohort every, every semester and we'll be looking to recruit again for the fall. You receive additional training in motivational interviewing, interprofessional collaborative practice, and in leadership to earn the expert student leader um, certificate. And uh, it's about 15 hours um, on Saturdays sometimes, after school sometimes. But um, we've had some really great um, sessions and the students have been enjoying it so far. And you don't have to take my word for it, you can ask them, they're here. A uh, couple of other comments. Could you please fill out the attendance sheet? We want to know um, what you thought of the event and how we could make it better. There's some place for your comments on the back at your leisure. And I do have an open invitation on April the 27th, it's a Thursday, at noon, we would love to host some interprofessionally minded students who want to tell faculty and a couple of big time national IPE trainers uh, what it's been like for you here at UNE as you've been following along in your interprofessional path. So we will feed you a nice lunch. It is in Biddeford. Um, the uh, national trainers are just going to have a little sort of a Q&A, a casual conversation over lunch, but there will be fa faculty there who will be very curious about your answers because we're always looking about how to improve our, our programming and you're our best source of information for that. So if you're interested in coming to lunch, come find me afterwards and I'll take your email address and we'll connect that way. I think those are my um, announcements and I thank you. Right, so we're going to go ahead and sort of wrap up um, the evening with a couple of announcements from Anthony. All right, and first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. We've been here for a while. We won't keep this uh, too long, but it really means a lot to see everybody, including my little sister, Allie. Thank you for coming out. Um, with that being said, we have some really cool events coming up. Um, one, we have a couple members of our group that are involved with Maine All Care, and they're showing a documentary at um, Maine Medical Center 
It's on the 13th. It's um, called Now is the Time. You can YouTube uh, like a little two minute preview of it, but um, I have no idea what's going on with insurance or single payer insurance or healthcare or any of that, but um, there are gonna be some smart people there who have an idea and it's gonna be a documentary, it's gonna be a good discussion and it's really important to stay plugged in now and just kind of talking about policy and what maybe a single payer, the advantages of that could be. Really cool opportunity, inviting professionals, students of every group alike. Am I skimping on anything? Yeah, we would love to have you guys down there. Six to eight, documentary, the 13th. Second thing, uh, primary care progress. We are a group of a little over 25 strong. Uh, we do not have any nursing students, so if you'd like to be a trailblazer in your um, professional path, we could use some more dental students. We could use more of everybody. Um, our next meeting is on the 26th, and again, same building, the Dana Center. Everybody's welcome, especially faculty. Um, professionals of every type are welcome. And yeah, we don't have the budget for food yet. Oh, hi. Yeah, I, I think it's Monday the 24th. Monday the 24th. Yeah, because, Whoops. yeah, like Deb said, Wednesday's the 26th. What a sharp eye. Yeah, it's my birthday. Oh, it's your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. If you come, we will all sing you a very happy birthday. Um, that's our next meeting. Everybody very welcomed to attend. We would love to see each and every one of you there. And, um, We've been doing some volunteering at the Preble Street uh, Food Pantry, Bounty Share. Kyle's kind of been spearheading that, his email's listed up there, but we kind of go as a team, an interprofessional outing, and uh, we get to give back a little in our greater Portland community. So I think those are our plugs, and thank you all again for sticking it out with us and for all the discussion, and yeah, look forward to seeing you. All right. And we can circulate these email addresses and our webpage um, later on today, but please feel free to email us if you have any questions. Um, now, for the exciting part, please pull out your um, handheld devices, except for those who have flip phones, and we're gonna go ahead and go through the evaluation via Poll Me, uh, or Poll Everywhere, sorry. Um, poll Everywhere, and if you can go ahead and read the questions on the screen of how closely do we meet the objectives of enhancing your knowledge of substance abuse management in primary care. And yes, someone already knows what I was gonna ask next. Go ahead and put what your ranking is for each of these um, objectives and we'll go through each of the options here. Thank you for <laughs> taking the time. And let's see. It doesn't tell us how many people are responding each, but I'll, st I'll stop talking when it stops moving the bars. How about that? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, oh. This is a lot like watching. Yes, I do, Dr. Brandt. I'm sorry. Okay, next one. How closely do we meet the objective of increasing your knowledge of the impact roles, responsibilities of interprofessional team members? This is fun. Yeah, we should have, that, yeah some sort of John Williams soundtrack would have been appropriate. Okay, I'm going to switch it now. All right, how close do you need the objective of increasing your knowledge of our main primary care chapters? 
primary care progress chapter, sorry. Okay, I think this is the second or the last one. How closely do we meet? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have to mouth breathe because I can't <laughs> cough and talk at the same time. You know how to read. There we go. Good job. Thank you. Do you appreciate my commentary? This is a lot. <laughs> if not, we can add a question to the evaluation. Okay. Overall experience. Right. I think it's the last ranking question, if that gives you any sort of a course. Okay, and just additional comments. These obviously won't be put up on the screen because you may have more than one word to say, but go ahead and enter your responses. And just so you all know, while you're typing away, we use these metrics because we intend to apply for grants for our chapter. So grants, and those who grant grants, enjoy numbers. So thank you all for contributing numbers. And otherwise, other comments so we can make our event next year more to your liking or more appropriate for our audience. Thank you all for coming. Thank <laughs> you.